It's time for part two of the questions that my couples asked in my Facebook group a few weeks ago. So let's dive in and answer the rest of these questions for you. Hello lovely couples and welcome back to my channel. I'm Lauren, wedding planner and owner of Bluebird Creative. I provide a weekly dose of wedding planning goodness for the modern couple. So if you haven't already guys, make sure you subscribe to my channel and you can also follow me over on Instagram at bluebird underscore creative where I do daily stories behind the scenes. We're a little bit more raw, we're a little bit real and it's just fun. And you can see what it's like running a wedding planning business and what we get up to. So without further ado guys, let's jump into this week's video, which is me answering some of your questions, your frequently asked questions. They were over in my Facebook group. I literally asked you guys, what was really bugging you? What did you need to know? And the response was crazy. So I've already done a part one to this video, which I will link up here for you now. This is the part two answering a few more of your questions. Let's go. <laughs> Okay guys, let's literally just jump straight in with the first question, which is an alternative to the first dance. Now, the person that asked this question didn't necessarily mean to have something completely different to the first dance. What their question actually stated was that their generation, which I'm gonna go with my generation, even though they're definitely younger, but it's the same same really. And that is that they're more used to going to clubs and bars and dancing with their friends, etc. They're not used to slow dancing. And I would say that that's probably pretty much most generations nowadays. So when it comes to doing a slow dance, it can feel a little bit awkward. And that was their question. They don't wanna feel really awkward. They don't really wanna do a slow dance. You don't have to, guys. My last wedding, which was last week, the couple chose Higher Love, which is an awesome track. They did dance with just the two of them, but they literally just danced. There wasn't any sort of slow dancing involved. They just danced. And as soon as the beat dropped, they literally got all their friends and families on the dance floor with them and they all just partied really really hard so you could go for something like that if it's the idea of you guys being on your own on the dance floor then you don't have to you could have your bridal party up there with you you could have your parents up there with you dancing as well it doesn't have to be a slow track it can just be something that's personal to you guys that's upbeat and fun so please don't stress about this too much don't feel like you have to slow dance remember guys you do you you can do whatever you want it's your wedding day so don't overthink it too much let's move on to the next question which is can you wear comfy shoes that are still stylish yes yes you can my friends i am I am now mid thirties and therefore I'm a big lover of comfort. I was the girl back in the day that would always have like the platform high heel, like really massive high heels. And nowadays I still am a fan, but you might not be catching me wearing them because comfort has definitely taken over. So I feel like this is a topic that I definitely have some knowledge on. There are some amazing shoes out there that are not as high, so they're still really, really comfortable, but they've got a little bit of a heel. Just the likes of ASOS, for example, you've got like a sort of a mid heel, or you can even have a block heel because they are a little bit more comfortable and you're a little bit more balanced. There's also absolutely nothing wrong with wearing a flat on your wedding day. If you wanna wear a trainer, wear a trainer, jazz it up, it can still look stylish. On my wedding day in the evening, I had a pair of Converse, guys. I styled it out with a load of Diamantes and a hot fix gun, and I loved it and it meant that I could dance the night away. I was super comfortable, but I wasn't at risk of treading on any broken glass or just basically having disgusting feet by the end of the evening. So there's definitely options out there, whether it's a heel, whether it's a flat, whether you just want a sandal, you can have your dress made or altered so that the bottom of the dress still finishes on the floor. If you haven't got heels on, you can have it taken up. So just make sure that when you go to those fittings that you take the shoes that you've decided on. So absolutely, yes, comfort and style can still happen together. The next question was, should you or should you not have a veil and is it a waste of money? This is an interesting question and I think it's very personal to be perfectly honest with you, but I can give you my personal feedback, which is I didn't have a veil and actually I look back now and I really didn't want a veil. I wasn't interested in having a veil in my opinion back then, which was, nearly eight years ago. I thought that veils were probably more for religious ceremonies. I don't actually think that nowadays, but I was, you know, in the dark and not very clued up back then. And I didn't have one. 
Whereas I look back now and I actually wish that I had worn a veil for the ceremony and maybe for the drinks reception as well and then taken it off from the wedding breakfast onwards. Because I just think they're really pretty and they just add a little something and it's a nice kind of change from the first part of the day and the ceremony section of the day to then changing it and taking it off for the second part of the day where it's more about the fun and the party. So I would now wear a veil if I could change that on my wedding day. But it is very personal. I wouldn't say that it's a waste of money it's just a personal preference do you want one do not want one don't feel like you have to have one because you don't sticking on the attire questions what does the groom wear and should it match the groomsman now again you know my motto guys you do you there are no set rules here so don't feel like ah what am i supposed to do you're supposed to do what makes you happy it doesn't matter so please don't overthink it. What people tend to do is they will have the groom and the groomsman in the same suits. They will usually be the same colour, they will be the same style, and then the groom will either have a different colour tie or cravat or whatever it is that he's wearing, or he might have a different coloured waistcoat. That's if you're going super formal. If you're just wearing suits with no waistcoats, then the groom may have a different coloured tie. Or, for example, again, this wedding that we did the other week, all the groomsmen and the groom, they all had navy suits on. They weren't formal, they were just nice suits, and then the groom wore a waistcoat as well and the groomsman didn't so it's just differentiating the groom to the groomsman but you can do that in any way you want to it is nice to have the groomsman in the same suits or at least the same color because it's obvious for other people as well to be able to spot a lot of bridesmaids nowadays will wear the same color but not the same dress but again you'll kind of know that, okay, yep, the pink dress is what the bridesmaids are wearing and it's quite easy to spot them and know that they're part of the bridal party. So I think the same thing goes with the groomsmen. But you do you guys, there are no set rules. I just hope that that helps guide you if you are one of those people that's not sure about that part of your planning. The bag of dreams, guys, the bag of dreams. I'm gonna link a video about the bag of dreams up here for you. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the bag of dreams is what I call my emergency kit. So as a wedding planner, I will have a massive emergency kit. I mean, it's huge. And in fact, I'm gonna link another video here where you can see me like packing it behind the scenes just to see what's in it. But the first video that I linked takes you through what I include and then what you could include as a bride because you don't need all the things that I'm including, which includes things like hooks and blue tack and extension leads and hammers and all the random things for the just in case moments. But I do advise the bride and the bridal party having the bag of dreams, the emergency kit, you know, which might have a spare pair of tights if you're wearing tights and it might have blister plasters and it might have extra deodorant and obviously the lipstick for the day because that's gonna need topping up. And it might have hair grips in it and it might have hairspray in it and all the things. You know, there's lots of random things that you can put in there. The question that was asked was, if you have the bag of dreams, does that mean that the maid of honor is carrying that around all day along with their bag as well? And the answer is no. I would say that the bag of dreams, which is usually the bride's bag, or it can just be a separate bag, the bag of dreams bag, just literally go and put that on the wedding breakfast table or go and put it somewhere where you can just come back to it. Please don't carry it around all day, bless you. You do not need to do that. Have it throughout the ceremony or have it somewhere safe throughout the ceremony and then when you arrive at the next part of the wedding day at the next venue or whatever, just go and place it on the wedding breakfast table or on your chair, then you'll know where it is, it's safe. You do not need to carry that thing around all day. So no, you do not need to be carrying two bags. Also, the bride should not be carrying a bag. So again, if you are, if they don't have a wedding coordinator or a wedding planner on site and you're their bridesmaid or maid of honor, take their bag, go put it on the table because they're not gonna want it, okay? just just. Get rid of that thing. Make sure it's safe, accessible, but they don't need to be carrying that. Really good question coming up next was what to do with the bridesmaids and the bride's bouquets after the ceremony. Now, you know me guys, I love to repurpose. I hate the idea of money being wasted and I hate the idea of flowers being wasted. So repurpose, repurpose, repurpose. Couple of different options for you. So the bouquets can actually be repurposed as part of the table centers. So your florist will work that into their plan and you'll know that those five bouquets, for example, have got to go on certain tables. They'll already have the vases on there. So after the ceremony, you can go and place them in and that will be part of the table centers. Perhaps you don't want to do that, 
perhaps you want to use those bouquets to decorate a particular area or to style up a table at like the guest book table there might be a vase there ready for that to go into there's lots of different options for you at one wedding recently after the ceremony when we got to the wedding reception venue I took the bouquets and there was this beautiful old ornate cabinet that had some photos of family that were unable to attend the wedding or that, that had passed away and we had some fairy lights decorated in there and then we also had some vases to place the bouquets in there as well and that was a really Really nice touch so it was kind of like a memory area and that was really lovely you may want to keep your bouquet and press it afterwards you may want to throw your bouquet and go down that tradition in which case you want going to want it to be sat in water throughout the day so use it use it to decorate a table you know don't just place it on a table in no water because then it's just going to die and look really sad throughout the day and that makes me sad. So repurpose it guys, absolutely repurpose it. Where can you put it that's gonna look pretty throughout the day? This next question was so good. The person said that their both their families live quite a way away from them. And so they decided that they're going to get married somewhere that's central to both sets of family and that they don't want to get married closer to one family than the other. My opinion on this is that makes me a little bit sad because I don't want you to feel like you have to choose somewhere that's central because if you were to find the perfect wedding venue for you that's maybe slightly more way than the other, go for it. You do you guys, you know, don't worry about, you know, the location. Surely if they love you, they'll still come. But I appreciate the question, so I'm going to roll with the question. And the question was, if we're going central to both sets of family, how can we find a venue if we don't know our guest numbers, if we don't know if they're going to come and make the effort to travel to that location? I hope you guys are still with me. I don't feel like I explained that very well. So in answer, you need to write out your guest list, first of all, and you need to base your search on that guest list. You also need to bear in mind if there's a minimum amount of number of guests required to be at that venue and then work out, do you think that's going to fit? You know, who do you really feel is going to come and will you hit that minimum? For example, for some venues, you have to have 80 guests attending. So that's how you go on it. It's not very easy and I appreciate the fact that it probably feels a little bit like a catch-22. You can't choose a venue and therefore the location until you know your guest numbers, but are you going to know your guest numbers until you've confirmed the location? So I do appreciate what you're saying, but write that guest list out, work out if you fit the minimum amount of guests and go with it and send those invites out. If they love you, they'll attend. So go for it. Same applies for destination weddings. So I appreciate it. You know, you might choose a location in Italy, for example, in the Amalfi Coast and you have to book the venue and you're not fully sure on how many of your guests are actually going to travel abroad to come to your wedding. So again, just check what that minimum is. Check what the minimum is and go from there. I hope that helps. I appreciate that it does feel like a catch-22, but sometimes you just gotta go for it. Last question for this video is lighting ideas. Now this is something that people just often forget with their weddings. We often have couples where we say, have you got any lighting or audio visual? And they're like, no. Now, it's not a necessity for your wedding. And if your budget is tight, then it's usually one of the first things that gets dropped off the budget. And I totally appreciate that. But it can really create a mood and an atmosphere. So if you're looking for additional lighting ideas, this particular question said, what other ideas are there except for up lighters? Now, if you don't know what up lighters are, they're basically lights that can be placed around the room. They kind of light up the wall and they can have a different filter on with different colors. So those are up lighters, which are an option. If you don't want up lighters, other options perhaps would be fairy lights. You can have canopies that come across. You can have canopies that go up pillars as well. You can also get some really cool old fashioned like spotlights that can create moments in the corner depending on what your theme is if you're having a theme for example and if they fit but you don't need to go to town fairy lights are usually a really nice option up lighters are the other option and then there's obviously neon signage which is really cool and on trend at the minute and i'm totally loving and that can create backdrops for photo booths but it can also just create a really nice moment it can be a saying that's really relevant to you guys it can be the decoration from behind the cake behind the top table or so on so those are some different options for you, but our clients tend to go fairly simple with their lighting, just creating a little bit of mooding, a little bit
bit of atmosphere with up lighters, fairy lights or neon signage. So there we go, guys. A few more questions answered from our Facebook group. I hope you found this helpful. If you've got any questions at all, then make sure you put them in the comments box below and perhaps we can add them all together and create another video for you guys. I hope you have an amazing week and I'll be back next week with some more wedding planning goodness. Thank you.